Well, good e good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to uh, a, a very different sort of George talk tonight, where we have three very distinguished speakers talking about the books which have been published about Orwell this year. So oh. right, Les, Les Hurst will give an overview of the books that have been published. Then uh, David Taylor will talk about Julia, the uh, reworking of 1984 by Sandra Newman from uh, the female point of view. Then Les will talk about Masha Karp's excellent book on Orwell and Russia, which is uh, particularly relevant in view of recent events in the far polar regions of Russia. Um, and then Peter will, will talk about Anna Funder's wifedom, and then we will have a, an open discussion. Um, Les, over to you. Thank you, Quentin. The box of 2023. Uh, as you can, uh, as Quentin has said, we have Professor Peter Stansky, DJ Taylor, and me talking about three. But before we talk about the three, let's have a look at what was an almost phenomenal year of books about Orwell. Um, it began with Professor Stansky's Socialist Patriot, looking at Orwell and war. Uh, the German small publisher, Camino Press, published all of Orwell's works on Jews and anti-Semitism in one work, which our member Ian Bloom used as the subject of an article in the Jewish Chronicle. Then came Catherine Bradley's novel, The Sisterhood, uh, which has been republished in paperback this month, uh, one of the first retellings of 1984 from a feminist point of view. In the spring came DJ Taylor's Orwell, The New Life, and uh, in the summer, Masha Karp's George Orwell and Russia. Uh, Orwell, The New Life and The Socialist Patriot, at least, uh, we have reviews of on the Orwell Society website. We had Glenn Burgess, George Orwell's Perverse Humanity, Socialism and Free Speech. Um, Glenn Burgess is due to talk to the Orwell Society later this year. Oliver Lewis, the Orwell Tour, has given us a George talk on his book of following Orwell's footsteps around the world. Peter Brian Barry's George Orwell, The Ethics of Equality, as far as I'm aware, only published in the USA, and I've not seen it at all. Then there was Anna Funder's Wifedom, uh, a subject of some controversy to our members. Adam Biles, Beasts of England, um, a response to Animal Farm. Sandra Newman, Julia, a feminist retelling of 1984. Les Wilson's book on Orwell and Scotland, Orwell's Island. A book I only learned the existence of yesterday, Brian Conaway, Year 84, which I understand, without having seen it, is a complete retelling of 1984 written only in Newspeak. And then I think, um, and if he nods his head, DJ Taylor can confirm this, that he has edited and annotated all of Orwell's nine books for Constable. No. Some of him, some of the nine books, six. Thank you. <laughs> and the small paperback uh, publisher Alma claims that they also have annotated editions of Orwell's work. The year before that, Oxford World Classics had taken advantage of the copyright end period to publish their own, um, which I can't recommend in uh, in completeness. But we are going to have three speakers. And our first speaker, talking about Julia by Sandra Newman, is DJ Taylor. Uh, it's very good to be here. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was very glad that um, I liked Sandra Newman's book because I met the author at a literary festival in America in the summer. and We got on rather well. It would have been horribly invidious had I then disliked what she'd written. Um, I want to start by giving this a bit of context, um, because Orwell himself started turning up in novels long before he died. Uh, his fictional debut goes as far back as John Haygate's Decent Fellows in 1930, where he features 
as an anonymous school prefect watching the headmaster, Kena Malefactor, in his study. Uh, there were subsequent appearances in the wartime writings of Innes Holden. Uh, he features as Basil in Stevie Smith's The Holiday in 1949. And there's a possible sighting in his friend Anthony Pohl's A Dance of the Music of Time, where Alf Eridge, Lord Warminster, can be found brooding over the bound volumes of Chums and the boy's, boy's own paper in the library at Thropworth, and might be thought to share some, at least some, of Orwell's puritanical detachment. And to these early walk-ons and fleeting cameos can be added a recent clutch of novels that attempt to dramatise various aspects of his career. And I'm, I'm thinking of Dennis Glover's The Last Man in Europe, which of course was 1984's working title, uh, which begins with him meeting Eileen in the Hampstead bookshop where he worked in the 30s. And then there's Norman Bissell's Barnhill from 2020, which follows the dying man around late 1940s Jura, and Peter Hodgkinson's Orwell Calling, uh, an ingenious reworking of his time at the BBC, which finds its hero caught up in a murder mystery. And now, of course, with the relaxation of copyright restrictions and the relative free for all that, that ensues, Sandra Newman's novel has veered off this track by abandoning fictionalized biography for a complete reinvention of, of his major work. 30,000 words longer than its template, Julia, I think, goes straight to the heart of 1984's central puzzle. And this is the role of its intransigent and no nonsense female lead. Uh, modern critics tend to argue, I think I'd probably argue myself, that the Winston-Julia relationship was a put-up job and Julia's a honey trap, commissioned by O'Brien and the hard-faced men of the inner party to serve Winston up on a plate to the re-educators of the Ministry of Love. Um, evidence for this claim rests on the passage that Orwell deleted from the original manuscript, uh, presumably on the grounds that it gave too much away. And this is the moment when Winston and Julia come across each other near O'Brien's flat, and Winston is oppressed by a curious feeling that although the purpose for which he had waited was to arrange another meeting, the embrace she had given him was intended as some kind of goodbye. But what uh, Sandra Newman does is to home in on another, what to me is the novel's key features, and, and this is the lack of effort, I think it's fair to say, that Orwell puts into Julia as a character. And with the exception of Winston's opening remarks and a handful of speculations about her inner life, we learn next to nothing about her and what goes on in her head. And the implication is that very little does. She's very resolutely unintellectual. She's not keen on reading. Uh, her reaction to Oceania's legendary banned book, Goldstein's theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism, is to fall asleep during Winston's recitation of it. And for all her tough talking, she's sometimes more figurative than decisive. And Julia's principal remit is to grant her an agency that Orwell pretty much denies her. And Newman, of course, has a whale of a time fleshing out the situational backdrops that the novel itself sometimes takes for granted. And there are glimpses of Julia, now surnamed Worthing, carrying out her daily routines at the fiction department. Um, specimen title of the books are things like Inner Party Sinners, My Telescreen is Broken, Comrade, trading black market goods with her prole chums, the Meltons, and occupying her leisure hours at the women's hostel, where the girls sit about watching propaganda's TV programmes about Our Friend the Potato, and a stint at lavatory cleaning duty turns up a dead fetus floating in the bowl, and a saunter past the football stage in its mural showing Butler's famous goal against East Asia. And all this is combined with what I thought was the neatness of much of the writing, um, the rude musk note of unwashed girl, was a sentence that struck me. And this has the effect of giving her a personality, albeit not much lesser a barbative personality than the Ur Julia's, as well as filling in the Oceanian backstory. And there is, for example, tantalizing mention of her parents who defended all the party's early crimes, the burning of parliament, the massacre at Sandhurst, the murder of the two princesses. And so we can infer that some kind of English revolution has taken place in the early 1950s and significantly traces to the cause of disparages at least even three and a half decades after the Labour leader's death. Now, there's a difficulty with this kind of what I suppose we call metafictional playfulness and that can be very soon turned knowing, if not absolutely tongue in cheek. Um, when Mrs. Melton, for example, brings news of a bomb attack um, and saying, I was out the, by the house where the Irish lived, that building that was the dog and trumpet before the landlord got his self purged, the most obvious casualty is plausibility. And the same goes for the junior anti-sex leads trips to the Museum of Venereal Diseases. Once the narrative switches to Julia's involvement with Winston, on the other hand, it turns sharper and more focused, and the risks that Julia is taking with her life are more clearly exposed. 
Julia's affair with Winston, uh, she's also seduced Parsons, by the way, and has plans for their co-worker, co-worker Amplethorpe, predates her involvement with O'Brien. And the winkling out of the personnel from records department turns out to be more of a bureaucrat's, a bureaucrat's power struggle than a zealot's hunt for subversives. And from Julia's angle, Winston, the last man in Europe, is a deeply unprepossessing cipher. And some of the bleakest passages find her caustically reflecting on scenes or lines of dialogue taken from Orwell's original. As she comments, for example, on Goldstein's explanation of doublethink, that the dimmest schoolchild could have told you as much. And yet more pointed, perhaps, is the assumption that the principles of oligarchical collectivism is like herself a plant invented by the truth boys, because, of course, the, the book was their work, not Goldstein's. But Julia, as the thought police's descent on their love nest about Mr. Charrington's antique shop soon reveals, has seriously overplayed her hand. Supposing that she'll be allowed to walk free from the Ministry of Love, she ends up having the rat cage intended for Winston attached to her own face. Tough baby that she is, Julia simply chews the head off the first rat and encourages its partner to feed off the corpse. And we then get an extended coda in which the narrative tugs free from Orwell to confirm earlier hints about the existence of a full-scale rebellion against the Oceanian state and reunites her with a, fellow in, with a fellow inmate from the hostel. Julia, categorised by a man named Reynolds about the length to which she's prepared to go in service of the Brotherhood, discovers that the new boss is much the same as the old one. I'd just like to end with a few remarks about where all this, I think, is going to go, because clearly what we call the, what is now going to be known as the Orwell novel has a future, and one can foresee a version perhaps of Coming Up for Air, retold by George Bowling's mirthless wife, Hilda, or a retread of Keep the Aspidistra Flying, as reimagined by Gordon Comstock's put upon girlfriend Rosemary, or even a mashup of a clergyman's daughter featuring the tramps with whom Dorothy fraternises on the road to the Kentish hop fields. And uh, we were talking earlier about the fact that this very week, Paul Theroux has published a novel called Burma Saib about Orwell's time in the East. I suppose there's an argument that I would perhaps make about most of these titles, real and imagined, is that in the end, they don't tell us very much about Orwell. This may, in fact, be the point about him. But I have to say, to conclude, that there's one book I'm really looking forward to, uh, and it's another reworking, and it'll be called 1984, The Rat's Tale. Thanks. Thank you very much, DJ Taylor. That was fantastic. Yes, uh, there's only a slight difference from sitting there biting the heads off whippets. Now, the second of the three books we're talking about today is George Orwell and Russia by Masha Karp. Uh, um, I hope that uh, once we open the conversation, uh, Masha will uh, will make some contribution. She wasn't sure that she could join us um, before today, um, and I'm pleased that uh, to see that she is here. Um, George Orwell and Russia is is um, a fascinating book. Um, I knew that she'd been working on it for a considerable amount of time. What the form would be, I wasn't aware until I opened it and discovered essentially it's two parts um, uh, giving it both uh, width and depth. That is to say, it's a historic work uh, which studies uh, how Orwell became aware of what had happened in Russia and essentially the betrayal of the revolution. And in depth, how he gained the elements he had of analysis which came out into the essays published essentially after the Second World War um, and which in turn we can read today when we try to examine what is happening in the post-Stalinist, post-communist Russia, which of course is proving to be uh, even more of a hor horrible enigma than we had perhaps hoped. Um, I draw attention to two or three elements that uh, Masha Karp um, draws attention to. Um, in the biographical element, what she points out is that during Orwell's time, when he was still Eric Blair, living in Paris, he had um, a wide connection with the Esperantist movement based there, some of whom had been in Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution. 
and had experienced the the uh, the damage and horrors that it was inflicting on those who were of liberal mind but of not of the bolshevist persuasion that is who weren't prepared to follow lenin and then stalin uh, this followed on when orwell um, moved back into england um, Masha has um, a very interesting point, and it's a criticism of her uh, Orwell's first biographer, uh, Bernard Crick, that Miffen Wee Westrope, the co-owner of Book Lovers Corner, where Orwell worked, had experience of Russia. She'd visited it. She'd been part of the Esperantist movement and that she'd seen how the suppression of the Esperantist movement in Russia had been um, just one example of uh, the Stalinist imposition of power and equally how the people that Miffen we Westrope had known had become afraid to admit to having any connection with her. Now, the uh, other criticism of this is that Miss, Mrs. Westrope lived long enough to write to Bernard Crick, when he announced that he'd published his biography, uh, it was going to uh, research the biography, uh, making him aware that she existed. And he did nothing for years until finally, when he did attempt to dis uh, contact her, she died. An appalling omission on his part. But the second element which comes in, in a, a later chapter in um, the book, and again, I think is of fantastic interest, is the section on Orwell and totalitarianism generally, which is based on Orwell's familiarity introduction to Franz Borkenau, and particularly the reading of his book on the totalitarian enemy. Um, what is quite clear, and Masha makes this clear too, is that Orwell gained far more from um, meetings with individuals as well as his reading meeting with individuals than um, we've been um, we've been aware of before now so while she's talking about George Orwell and Russia what she's also talking about is or is the way that Orwell um, Orwell's intellectual development was based on a very deep familiarity from people who'd actually been there. The famous question uh, that uh, people after the war, when uh, when Samistat copies of 1984 and Animal Farm reached the uh, Eastern Europe was, how did he know? Well, partly it was because he had a, a, an, an intelligence that could understand the implications of everything that was going on. But it was also that he had been interrogating and engaged in dialogue with people who had been there. Masha goes on to a last chapter of the book, which is actually on what events are uh, have been recently in Russia. Um, I suspect that before long, when the second edition is published, that final paragraph, uh, that final pa uh, chapter will require an updating um, and possibly an extension. But meanwhile, I would recommend George Orwell and Russia, not simply because it deals with George Orwell and Russia, but because it deals with such great depth with uh, Orwell on totalitarianism. Now, Masha is not a complete fan of Orwell's work, and she points out that in some cases, um, what he says is contradictory, that he uses the word socialism in some places in two contrary uh, meanings. And similarly, democracy, he points out, can have uh, problems with it too. But equally, I think that I would recommend the book simply because it contains so much and it st stands so much rereading. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to Professor Peter Stansky, who is going to talk about wifedom. Peter, please. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, well, I'm talking about the rather controversial book, Wifedom by Anna Funder, uh, a distinguished Australian writer whose previous book, which I haven't read, Sassyland, about East Germany, got a lot of favorable attention. 
uh, wifedom, in fact, uh, you know, obviously I disagree with him, uh, has received quite a few uh, positive, bland or positive reviews, uh, as well as um, some uh, some negative negative reviews. Uh, I think it's a, a deeply flawed book. And uh, first, I'll discuss the my well serious flaws, but not the major flaw, which I'll conclude with um, uh, in the book. Uh, it it's incredibly uh, full of errors and about all his life. Uh, uh, most famously, in in uh, a couple of sentences towards the beginning where she says that Orwell was born in Burma rather than India, that he went back to England when he was two rather than he was less than one. And third, most extraordinarily, considering the existence of such such were the joys, uh, that he went to a crammer's in order to get into, uh, to be, uh, got a scholarship, a, fellow, a king scholar at Eton. Uh, but but the book is just amazingly uh, full of errors. Uh, but also, what I meant to say at first is, I, I hope very much uh, that I'm not being defensive uh, uh, about the book, uh, because DJ Taylor, uh, 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 myself, and the other male biographers are uh, uh, tapped in the book as members, not a term of praise, uh, as members of the patriarchy, the male biographers of of, uh, of Orwell. Of course, that's what I should have said, which is obvious from the, the uh, title of the book, uh, the main accusation made against us is that we ignore or don't sufficiently credit um, Eileen. Uh, and uh, in my view, that's that's totally untrue. Of course, uh, when we wrote, and of course, uh, D.J. Taylor's new biography of, of new version of the biography of Orwell takes uh, uses them of uh, the new letters that of 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 Arlene's that surfaced. Um, I think that we we use whatever material. One of the sections of my own book about Orwell is called Arlene, one third of the book. Uh, we we wrote about Eileen as much as we could, and I think we wrote about us about her favorably, uh, contrary uh, and 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 uh, contrary to what what uh, Anna Funder, not that we attack. He she doesn't quite accuse us of attacking her, but rather of ignoring her, uh, which I think is totally untrue. And also, what's outrageous. Is is uh, Sylvia Trump has written a wonderful biography of Eileen, and um, uh, again, uh, Eileen, Mrs. Orwell's Invisible Life, uh, was made visible by Sylvia, and again, uh, Anna Funda mentions us. She attacks us, but she also uses us in in in. Um, uh, 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 uses what we've written. She credits us, she cites us in her extensive end notes, but in fact, irritatingly and irresponsibly, uh, the book doesn't have an index. So it's very difficult to sort of track, retrack uh, how how uh, we may come up and are attacked and used as member of the patriarchy. Um, and also, um, uh, the other two problematical aspects of the book uh, that aren't aren't mentioned enough in the reviews, uh, it's in this new category that's gotten a lot of attention, uh, it, it, known as creative nonfiction, and the book is full of made-up dialogues between Orwell and others. Uh, which in a what a book that purports to be a biography uh, is is um, you know very very questionable uh, a, a way of proceeding um, and so that's a questionable part of the book that hasn't been uh, is, I seems to me sufficiently criticized and the third part which is third criticism. 
uh, is is uh, it's it seems to me it's also an extremely self indulgent text, and she talks writes quite a bit about her own family and and uh, her own husband, children, etc. And and the uh, their relevance, alleged relevance, to the story that she has to tell. But uh, it seems to me that the major flaw of the book, which was eloquently pointed out by Quentin Cop in a letter to the TLS uh, some issues ago, is that I think, and of course this is the subject we can discuss in uh, later. It fundamentally misunderstands uh, the uh, Eileen George relationship. The theme of the book, it seems to me it's fair to say, is that George exploited and mistreated Eileen, and that he made her into a drudge to clean out the latrine, to type his books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But but uh, and then also he was scandalous that he went to be a reporter in your in Europe uh, when she was going to have our operation. One might argue that Eileen shouldn't have done what she did, but as Quentin points out, and which I think is undoubtedly true, she chose to do what she did. She chose to be George's helper. She urged George to do uh, go, go go abroad to be a reporter and not to worry about the operation. So the book is 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 totally flipped. It seems to me uh, a a true interpretation of of um, what uh, what what the relationship uh was and and uh you know many Eileen was a very impressive bright interesting uh, she subsumed herself to George uh but she chose to do so now on the other hand uh and also I don't if I remember correctly Anna Funder doesn't give any mention that, you know in 1984 Daphne Pate uh, published, I thought, in a way, a historical, in some ways, a flawed book uh, about about Orwell as misogynist, and it seems to me uh, a critical book. Uh, uh, maybe it's being written or has been written, and I don't know about it. Uh, Orwell's relations with women, you know, beginning with his pouncing on Jacintha. Uh, when uh, you know when he was uh, quite young, and his uh, as he said to Sir Kerwin, uh, his chief hope in life was to be what he would, if he had a wish to have anything that he might be, he wanted to be irresistible to women, and you know whether and you know as we know he proposed to four people. Uh, four women uh, uh, abruptly, and 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 he 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 had a lot of things. And there's an interesting question: to what degree Eileen, uh, whether or not they agreed to have an open marriage or not. I mean that that's a very interesting area. And I think a book uh, there could be more studies, and in a way, it would have been appropriate for Anna Funder to talk about that. Uh, did, did Orwell's relationships and approaches to women, how did they relate to what we value so much about Orwell, his commitment to human decency? Did he behave decently with women? And, and uh, you know, the, the relationships, the flings he undoubtedly had were consensual. I don't think there's an issue about that. I don't think he abused women, other than perhaps the the pounce on 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 or the attack on uh, Jacintha. Uh, but you know whether it was proper behavior or not is an interesting point. But it's not an issue that I, I think Anna Funder discusses. So I think it's a provocative and a, but a deeply flawed uh, book. Uh, and it'd be very interesting to see what what uh, others 
have to say about it. But we have to be careful, not as the Orwell Society, etc. Uh, we have to be careful not to be overly defensive. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Peter, David, and uh, and Les. Um, uh, interesting. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has seen this. Les, I think if you could put it on the chat, Martin Tyrrell has done uh, a very forensic review of, of wifedom. Who would like to be our first questioner? I would certainly welcome, since we've had, uh, as Les rightly pointed out, three gentlemen talking about three ladies' books. Um, a lady to start the ball rolling. Thank you very much. First, just a quick comment about Peter's interesting talk. Unless he said this while I went to get a drink of water, I think he left out my very favorite error, the reference to the three minutes hate, which I put in the chat. When I read that, I just burst out laughing. Um, I was also interested in what the first speaker said about how, you know, the sort of standard view that Julia is really perfunctory because she's not an intellectual, she doesn't read, and we don't get into her head. I think there are a number of problems here. First of all, since the story is told from Winston's standpoint, we don't get into anyone else's head, including Mr. Charrington, O'Brien, Syme, and so forth. Second of all, as we know from many other contexts, Winston does not think very much of intellectuals, so it doesn't seem to be a put-down of Julia that she's not much of an intellectual. Third of all, I want to point out the ways, although I actually mentioned this in my talk in the past, um, that Winston, sorry, that Orwell does stress that Julia is in her own way very insightful, illustrating his general view that you don't have to be an intellectual to be insightful. In some ways, she was far more acute than Winston and far less susceptible to party propaganda. Once when he happened to mention in some connection the war against Eurasia, she startled him by saying casually that, in her opinion, the war was not happening. I'm skipping a couple of passages. And then he goes on to say this was an idea that literally had never occurred to him. We're also told that she started sort of envying him by telling him that during the two minutes hate, her great difficulty was to avoid bursting out laughing. He recognized that she has a practical cunning that he lacks. And she has insights like if you kept the small moves, you could break the big ones. Finally, I want to call your attention to a very moving passage where he's saying how hopeless things are for them. And she says, if you, he, uh, if you mean confessing, we'll do that right enough. Everyone always confesses. You can't help it. They torture you. And then he says, I don't mean confessing. Confession is not betrayal. What you say or do doesn't matter. Only feelings matter. And they make me stop loving you. That would be the real betrayal. And then she says, they can't do that. It's the one thing they can't do. They can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you. As, of course, we all know she turned out to be wrong. But I think this illustrates that she has thought in graphic, important, unpretentious, non-intellectual ways, the sort of thinking Orwell admires. Thank you very much for this new move. Jeffrey, please. Uh, can you hear me, Quentin? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen and uh, and ladies, for uh, comments. And I've, I was a bit late uh, tuning in. Um, my wife and I both, um, I didn't mean to say my wifedom, my wife and I uh, both uh, read um, Anna Funder's book and uh, my wife read it right through and was absolutely disgusted with it. Um, I didn't get past the end notes. I thought it was it was very badly put together. I didn't even sort of want to read the thing. Um, I read bits and pieces, but I thought the way the book was structured and how to follow end notes and that, I just thought it was it was just very badly put together by the publisher. I think the publisher is as bad as what the author is. Anyway, getting back to um, the actual issue. Um, as some of you may know, I wrote an essay a while back for the uh, Orwell Society on, on the uh, the role of Julia um, in 1984. And I would just suggest to uh, the, the speakers that um, maybe Orwell's uh, feelings about his wife um, were put into the character of Julia. Uh, I'm not uh, alone in, in, in um, saying that, but I think that if you look at the way Julia is... Um, is portrayed in the novel, 
Um, you don't have to read my essay, but uh, if you look at the way she's uh, portrayed, she actually comes across as a very positive woman and not not a spy that's out to uh, to uh, to get him. Um, I think the same thing about O'Brien. But um, I think um, that Orwell, maybe in this last novel, uh, was actually attributing a lot of his um, success and in, in his his writing to his wife that had helped him so much. And I think that Julia is a very positive figure and a positive figure for women uh, in trying to um, attack totalitarianism. Uh, I think she's extremely positive as I think um, his wife was. Mm. Yeah, I would certainly agree with you, Jeffrey. Mm. Um, I mean, one, one of the... Um, sort of counters to Anna's thesis is that uh, Orwell, right from the beginning with his mother and his aunt, uh, spent time with and valued time with strong, positive, intelligent women. And that's why he chose Eileen. Yes. And the the, the point that, um, that Peter made about she, she chose to work closely with with uh, Orwell was mm. just a continuation because she That's had right. done the same for Eric, her brother. And if you read Eric's uh, biography on the Royal College's website and see the list of publications that she put order into and coherence into uh, from Eric's... Uh, uh, random writing of <laughs> great intellect uh, but like a lot of people of great intellect it didn't mean he could um he could express himself in the way that was easily accessible to others um it, it, it you know she 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 made him anna's made her out to be a drudge and when she claims that she's bringing her out into the light sylvia brought her out into the light thank you my little rant over Charlotte. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm unmuted now. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the three speakers. It was really interesting. Um, I'm myself, I'm uh, no Orwell expert, but uh, I found wifedom uh, problematic as well. Um, I, I thought the fictionalized parts were terrible. And I agree with Peter um, that um, you know, Orwell's relationships to women, it's is something that, you know, would be worth exploring more. And um, as um, an endometriosis sufferer myself, I'm well placed to know that intimate relationships uh, with a partner are uh, problematic. So I think that's something that uh, as, you know, a, a woman uh, Anna Funder could have explored more in that respect. And I actually had a question for you, Quentin, because I know that you got in touch with Penguin um, yeah. to try and, um, you know, um, amend some errors. And I was wondering if you um, had a response because the paperback is going to come out. And um, I know that rights were sold to France because um, I know the, the French translator who's been working on the book and I warned her that maybe uh, hopefully there would be some corrections coming and for example I told her about the error about um, Orwell being born um, uh, in India not in Burma so I was wondering if in the paperback and um, you know translations there could be some modifications well we 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 don't um we don't know exactly what they're going to correct. Uh, Ariana's um, got her hand up to to talk in a second, um, and she will explain uh, what she got corrected. Um, some of the basic errors, uh, for example, his birthplace and his father working in Burma. Um, Richard had got Richard Blair had got got uh, changed. There were some egregious errors about my father, which I hope for, I they've said they will change. Uh, for example, that he he wrote to Eileen 
when he was working for the British Secret Service in 1940. In 1940, he was fighting in the Battle of the Marne with uh, the French Foreign Legion. He wasn't vetted for the British Secret Services uh, until 1943. Um, these errors are incredible because she was constantly asking me during this process of writing this book for stuff. So if, if, if I hadn't corrected a hell of a lot more errors, God knows how many there would have been over and above what is already, a, 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 has been pointed out, a, 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 an error-laden book. So it will be interesting to see exactly what has changed. Uh, Jackie Robson, would you mind if I ask Ariana to speak next? Because it would seem a, a natural uh, uh, way to, uh, to answer that question better. No, so thank you very much, Quentin. Yes, um, my mother, Celia Cohen, um, was egregiously um, libeled, as it were, in this book. And um, pretty much everything she said about my mother was wrong. And I was furious. And I wrote to the publishers immediately. And they hedged their bets um, and put me off. Uh, it took about a month for me to chase them. But eventually, I got a complete climb down from the publishers, which I imagine they obviously must have checked with Anna Funda and they agreed to change everything that I asked them to change about my mother um, with one very small and admittedly slightly um, debatable point. They said that they would change it immediately in the digital editions, that it would be changed in all future print editions and translations, but I can only um, assume that they have done that in the digital edition and will do it in all future editions. But I, I didn't point out the factual errors about the place of his birth, um, etc. I, I simply confined my letter to the ways in which he had, um, you know, he had traduced my mother and her reputation. Um, but I do agree that, I mean, I don't know where to begin on this book, but that he, she seemed to get absolutely everything about his relations with women wrong. Uh, Ines Holden was my mother's first cousin, um, and I knew Ines extraordinarily well. Ines was one of Eileen's closest friends. I mean, the fact that she portrayed Eileen as this drudge, as you say, um, somebody who was, who, you know, who was sort of bullied and submission by him. I mean, it couldn't have been further from the truth, as, as you've all pointed out already. Um, it was a, it's a shocker of a book, in my view. And um, I look forward to seeing how many changes they make in future editions. Indeed. Uh, I should say that Ariana's biography of her mother is being published later in the year, and oh, Ariana yes. will be giving us a George talk on that book. And Glenn Burgess was mentioned earlier, and Glenn will be giving a George talk next month on his book. Jackie, thank you for being patient. Uh, thank you. Um, I, 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 I've read the book, obviously, and, um, I, and I totally take on board everything everybody has said here about the factual errors and, and the way that maybe Eileen has been portrayed. And I think one thing about the book that came across to me was the fact that she wasn't portrayed as a joyful person. And I'm sure well, there must have been a lot of joy in her life. The only bit where I can see, I can joy really coming over was at the point where they adopted Richard. Uh, but up until then, as you see, she's portrayed um, as a drudge. Um, but I've got to say, I did enjoy reading the book, um, even though I accept the factual errors and the, and the people may not um, are not happy with the way that pe characters, people in the book were portrayed and the conversations, et cetera, they were all fictional. The only thing I could, I would say uh, in defense of it possibly is the fact that I think she's just, She's viewing it from the perspective of how she interprets it from as we are in 2024. And, and we know that there are problems, aren't there, about we judging history 
by our own values, etc. Uh, and that brings a lot of problems. And the reason I think that she brought the children and the husband in with for this was for the same reason. It was how they might perceive the relationship as of the time, but that was of the time society was as it was, and we can't judge society then by our standards and the way society is now. Um, but it is a bestseller, isn't it? And a lot of people are going to be, have read that book. Um, and uh, and I, I think obviously you need to make sure that all those factual errors, uh, et cetera, if possible, can be corrected. But um, I did find it very interesting. Um, and as it's a woman's perception of that relationship um, just as the other, bi apart from Sylvia, other biographers, you know, uh, have talked about Eileen, and, but obviously that is from a male perspective, and that is her perspective of what the relationship was like, and then being the only person that could actually tell us what that relationship was like is Eileen herself, which is not here, and she, and she can't do that, and I think sometimes that's with biographies etc and, and people um that that's what people have to to take on board when they're when they're reading it um but i i, I obviously take on board everything everyone said here and i totally agree with the, the things that, that you said i.e that factually it needs to be correct etc and that if you looked at it she could have looked at it in other ways and yes it would have been really interesting if she had looked more at all wells relationship with women um and, and perhaps maybe it may looked at that in the less in a more positive way because as you've all said here it's also that it was consensual and and, and whether or not that there was an open relation, marriage I don't know. Uh, maybe you could. Well, the, 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 the reality is that there's only one suggestion of a relationship she might have had with somebody. There's uh -huh. no evidence uh, to conclusively prove she had a, a sexual relationship with my father. Oh. And there's no evidence that she had any sort of sexual relationship with anybody else. Uh -huh. um, Anna's written the book. She's a by profession, she was a human rights lawyer. Um, to my mind, she's written the book, having decided what the uh, jury are going to decide, and then uh, uh, produced evidence in inverted commas uh, to support her thesis. Um, and yes, she's a very fluent writer, very easy to yes. read. Um, yes. Rick, Rick, well, I can see your hands up. There we go. Yeah, I just, this is from a personal point of view. Uh, one of the things that she says in there that uh, my Aunt Avril was a sourpuss, uh, which I take great uh, uh, offence to. She's turned a negative into a positive in, in her book. Actually, Avril was uh, a most wonderful uh, sister to my brother and an aunt to me uh, in the sense that she uh, defended my father from all comers who wanted to come and, and uh, spend time, waste his time. Uh, I can think of one person in particular, but I won't mention his name. Um, when he lived on Jura, when she came up in 1946 to, to look after the house at Barn Hill. Uh, to say that she was a sadness is absolutely appalling because actually Admiral had a wonderful sense of humor and uh, it, you, but you had to live. I mean, I, I I can tell you this because I lived with Avril for, for for many years. So you'll have to take my word for it. But she's she she was just a wonderful uh, aunt to me. She looked after me. She she not only she looked after me, but she she loved me very 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 deeply. Mm. Um, and so I I I just feel it it just irritates me intensely that she did this. So this is a, a personal moan, mm. um, but they, what I have to say is possibly or probably is that wifedom will eventually fade away in the sense that we are making a, a, a big deal of it, um, but it will never ever uh, survive 
the, 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 the literary canon of, uh, of, of her books or certainly my father's. That my father will continue to be read long after she has gone. Uh, Ariana, you want to come back? I just wanted to say a very quick thing. She calls her book, which is a strange mishmash of fiction and supposedly fact, but she calls it counterfiction, doesn't mm -hmm. she? But I would have thought she should call it counterfaction because actually yes. she got so many of those facts wrong that yes. really um, that would be a much more appropriate term. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, as, 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 um, Rick obviously knew Avril very well. My mother knew Eileen very well. And uh, the way she describes Eileen is uh, uh, absolutely nothing like the Eileen that I was told about by my mother. Les. Thank you. Um, yeah, if I can do the share screen again for a moment. Uh, while I was preparing for this, um, this evening, I've actually drawn up a list of, of these books that Peter first mentioned and Ariane has just mentioned, this subgenre of, of um, creative reimagination, um, which seems to be a specifically Ameri an American trait. But uh, we have the expertise of, of, of DJ Taylor, who knows a lot about publishing and fiction, who perhaps will we can get to comment on this. But the, this is a list of books um, which are all in this creative reimagination uh, published uh, essentially in the last 25 years. So there was there was Dutch, a memoir of Ronald Reagan, which seems to have started it. Um, American Wife, which is a, a fictionalization of the life of Laura Bush. Alice I Have Been, which is a retelling of the life of Alice Liddell. Zed, The Beginning of Everything, of, of Zelda Fitzgerald, the wife of um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. The Girls, about the, the women in the Manson family. Rodham, uh, about Hillary Rodham Clinton. And then much more recently, Dirty Birds, about <laughs> extraordinarily the Canadian singer Leonard Cohen. And The Queen of Tuesday by Lucille Ball. Uh, these are only the titles that... Um, since I heard about this uh, genre, I've been able to produce in a quick list. But I, I wonder, um, I wonder if DJ Taylor, David, do you know anything about this genre or why it's taken off? It is. It is. You're, you're right that it is, it's a fashionable modern phenomenon, uh, but it does go back a very long way. In fact, you know, the, these fictional, I mean, I would... Uh, I'm sure there will be readers here, for example, who will remember some of some e Evelyn Waugh's uh, efforts in this genre. You know, for example, Helena, his life of the third century Roman empress is a kind of reimagining of. Uh, and so um, it is it is pretty much an American thing. But, uh, you know, there are English practitioners. And I remember, again, this is perhaps rather an obscure novel, an early novel by Philip Henscher about 30 years ago, where the character, I think, was Mrs. Thatcher's skin. If you, I know that sounds that sounds bizarre, but it's uh, it's. And in fact, in some ways, the the um, it's uh, there's there's a kind of hybridization going on at the moment between genres in which biographies are becoming more fictional, if you see what I mean, and fiction is becoming more biographical. Uh, and this creates there was there was I remember about twenty years ago, and Andrew Motion wrote a book about Thomas Wainwright, the celebrated early nineteenth century poisoner. And uh, it was described as an experimental biography. And when Motion ran out of fact, he started making them up, uh, although he was careful to demarcate. Um, and in fact, I would I would uh, be guilty to having done this myself, uh, my biography of Thackeray. There are some kind of fictionalized interludes. But the, you, you, the, I think the only thing that you have to ask is that, that, that writers are very scrupulous about how they do this. And I think there's a danger, there's certainly a danger um, I I'm, I'm, don't really particularly want to say anything much about Anna Funder. I've, I've kept sort of, I think, quite reasonably detached from this, although there are some remarks in an afterword to the paperback of Orwell, The New Life, which is out, um, out next month. But uh, there is this there is this idea that you, uh, you know, that you can explore um, uh, a real person by 
unreal means, uh, which is fine as long as you accept those boundaries and those demarcations and point out where they are. And I think the problem, the, the drawback of that, whatever may be said about the funder and its merits uh, and its demerits is that I've, I, I certainly thought that a lot of the people who reviewed it were not people who knew anything about Orwell. And so we're taking everything that was said in there as a matter of fact. Um, and the other thing, too, was I think that uh, um, although Funda makes clear or makes clear where she's making stuff up, there is this kind of general presupposition that it was, quote, a biography. And I've seen it, you know, I've seen it reviewed as a biography. I've seen it in list of the years biography. And I think there is a danger that people, unlike ourselves, who are not expert in these matters, will go away from it thinking it's the literal truth. That, that, that is a real concern especially uh, the some of the uh, reviewers who are chosen for their uh, feminist views and uh, the the uh, Oxford uh, guy who's uh, 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 who reviewed for the London Review of Books made up a whole load more uh, fabrications to add to to Anna's well, I can see if I, the, the only other thing I would add, I can see uh, Sylvia's, Sylvia Top has joined us on screen. Hello, yeah. Sylvia. Uh, when I read the subtitle of Anna Funder's book, you know, Invisible Life, my first thought was, invisible to whom exactly? Uh, oh, yeah. some, we, we, thanks to Sylvia, we know huge amounts uh, about her. And um, I think the, the, one, the one final point perhaps I would make about um, wifedom is that uh, obviously, her principal source is those letters of, of Eileen's that were discovered, I think, in 2005, uh, and Peter Day, the late, great Peter Davison prints up in The Last Orwell. Um, and they are extraordinary documents, and they reveal an extraordinary personality. Uh, but I wouldn't want to take them at face value, because they're written in that kind of private code of a, a very intimate husband-wife relationship, where sometimes more is being said than is accurate, and sometimes less is being said. They're full of gaps and interstices, and I, and I, and I think the, to navigate your way about those letters is an extraordinarily difficult task. I, I can remember puzzling over them for hours as to what particular sentences meant. And of course, they're written to a very old friend again there's a kind of cipher there that i think has to be decoded and they are very very tricky documents and i'd be very interested to hear what sylvia had to say about about those letters well, the, the, uh, what the, the, other, the other person she, the other person she relies on david a lot is somebody again who i i knew 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 quite well uh, and that's lydia uh, lydia jackson is the most unreliable witness Oh, I absolutely agree. And um, I, 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 I puzzled, I puzzled for ages in what exactly Lydia's motives were, and the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, and the kind of. I, I do think I've, one of the things I, that did struck me very much about Orwell, and I can see it too in some of the newly discovered letters to Eleanor Jakes, uh, which there, there were a lot of occasions I think in which he was pretty much delusional about the relationships he thought he was pursuing with women, when in fact he mm -hmm. wasn't pursuing them. Um, some of the letters to Eleanor presuppose a by the time she got engaged to Dennis Collings in 1934, presuppose a relationship that I don't think actually existed anymore. And mm. it's very, very difficult to interpret. But what does Sylvia have to say about this? Well, if if you wouldn't mind, Christopher and Richard, uh, I'd like to bring Sylvia in first, and I also like to bring Masha in after Sylvia because she would like to make a contribution uh, and I, I would hope that we can extend the discussion to cover Julia and Masha's book rather than solely focus on uh, on Anna Fundus. Sylvia. Well like Peter said <clears throat> it's very hard not to be defensive so I'm always worried if I say too much criticism of wifedom that I'm just trying to defend my own book. But she certainly, I believe, uses um, a lot of my material without crediting me at all, references to books that I found that were very difficult to find. And she repeats the information that, I, that was in my book without detailing where she got it at all. As far as the letters go, the new letters, I am preparing, as David knows, a, a collection of all of Eileen's letters to be printed next year, I think. And I will be annotating all of those letters in great detail because um, 
her relationship with Nor is um, it's quite amazing, you know, how much endless detail she gives in those letters. But all her letters are so important because she was such a, a powerful woman for Orwell. She arranged everything behind the scenes for him, dealt with the agent, um, made their travel arrangements. So none of that has been credited to her in, in particular. And I noticed with that list of books that um, Les showed us, they were mostly about women and probably women who someone thought had been underrated or overlooked. So what else was I supposed to talk about? Well, that, that's, that's very helpful, Sylvia. And uh, uh, I'm pleased you've told people about your your uh, your work on the letters. I mean, the 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 biggest thing that 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 that, that Anna Fonda misses out in the letters, especially those to Nora, is is irony. You know, the famous letter about I've saved this up so I could write a round robin to everybody, um, is is absolutely larded with irony. Um, and she's wonderful. taken it. She's taken it literally. Eileen has such a wonderful sense of humor, and yeah, and absolutely, has no sense of humor at all. Yeah. So. Thank you, Sylvia. M Masha, and then we'll come to Christopher and Richard. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, everybody, for discussing my book. And uh, thank you, Les, for a very, very flattering review of it. I'll say just a few words about Wifedom, which I haven't read, so I'm not going uh, into any detail here. But of course, I would like to pick up from uh, what Sylvia has just said about her uh, sense of humor, because I remember one of the things that I uh, always remember about Harlan is a quote from her friend, uh, but um, from uh, um, uh, the, uh, Patricia O'Donoghue, not her friend, but uh, the friend of Lydia, uh, who quoted Eileen as saying at one point that in their cottage in Wollington, there were so many mice that they shoulder to shoulder pushed all the, um, all the plates uh, and cups down. And I thought that's already, uh, you know, a bit of an animal farm in the, even in this uh, sentence, because there is this feeling of the grotesque that she possessed. And obviously, uh, you can imagine her and Orwell having enormous fun um, uh, thinking of uh, this uh, of this book, but naturally it was written by him and not by her. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make is that uh, Richard Blair has just said that he hopes uh, this book will go away. Uh, I mean, the the um, uh, its influence. In the journal that uh, I'm uh, sending to the publishers, today or tomorrow, and hopefully we'll all receive uh, by, uh, well, in March at least. Uh, we have an article uh, of John Rodden, who is really scared by the possibility of this particular book damaging Orwell's reputation, unthinkable as uh, it can be, because he thinks that is what, as uh, um, David said, what uh, lots of people who don't know much, they will think, well, who, this guy who, who is so mistreated, his wife and all the rest will, will disappear. So uh, when you see the journal, you'll see uh, whether it seems convincing to you or not. I just hope that maybe John is wrong on this. But, uh, but he treats uh, this danger very, very seriously. And uh, about my book, I mean, the primary motive for me, of course, was uh, in writing this book, was uh, to show to the English reading public that in our part of the world, not just in Russia, but in Eastern Europe uh, as well, uh, people read it differently because it was all too familiar. 
And now these uh, couple of days, as I'm sure you know, are very tra tragic because of the uh, obvious murder. I, I would, uh, you know, I'm not writing it and I'm not um, having to bring proofs, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it was an assassination of Alexei Navalny in prison because, uh, um, you know, there is a video of him a day before and he didn't look so emaciated or, or, or um, so bad. But what I think is very important and why people in Russia and in Eastern Europe in the past remember Orwell so well is this feeling of absurdity that Orwell noticed in the most cruel um, developments of uh, the totalitarian regime. I'll just give you one example. Uh, people went out uh, to the streets not to protest against Navalny's uh, uh, obvious, uh, uh, obviously, well, against Navalny's end, let's put it like this, uh, but uh, to put, to commemorate him, to put flowers, and uh, lots of people were detained. I know somebody who just came out and just uh, received 10, uh, 10 days of arrest just for going out. But, but the absurdity is that an Orthodox priest wanted to read a sermon in commemorating uh, Navalny. And in the country where they're constantly saying these are our values, orthodox values, you can't uh, mock uh, the, uh, the, the religion as the girls, the pussy riot girls did uh, in the church so many years ago. They arrested him, they are incriminating him, the uh, organizing of uh, the uh, unsanctioned rally, because, you know, any rally has to be sanctioned. And uh, uh, this is the absurdity of it. You know, you should be happy that a priest wants to say something about somebody passing. No, this is the thing, the uh, uh, cruelty and absurdity, a very stable combination for regimes like that. And Orwell was one of the first who recognized it. And that's why when something like this pe happens, people say, well, this is Orwell. Sorry, sorry for, for talking for long. No, no, thank you very much, Masha. Uh, Christopher, please. Thank you, Masha. Thank you. And thank you all for your books, Masha. I, I really enjoyed your book and DJ Taylor and Peter, all of your books. Um, this is actually sort of a response to something that uh, Les said earlier. And, you know, again, we sort of come at this from my particular bias that I'm based in Hollywood and I, I write for the cinema. But Les, do you think that perhaps this genre that you point to of sort of fictionalized biographies, particularly in the United States, is influenced by the uh, by cinema and by the sort of interplay between writers who would work in cinema and in fiction. Because in cinema, the sort of genre of fictionalized biography is like a very established genre yeah. and sort of by necessity, something that occurs there. And it sort of leads to a question I've had as I was listening to all of you, your conversation. Um, and so, and so Peter knows this already, I think again, to give my background, I've for many years been adapting Peter's biography of Orwell into a screenplay, into a movie. Um, but do you feel like the issues, particularly in a funders book, is it a, a framing narrative where it's just not clear what's fictional and what is, is seen as a biography? Is it all right to sort of try to write scenes, imaginary scenes between these characters if it's set up as a, oh, this is a movie or this is actually just a work of fiction? Well, I, I'm not a great expert on this. Um, and, and people have commented... Um, the recent Polish film about uh, the, the the Welsh journalist, Mr. Jones, which brought Orwell in, um, is one of those works which definitely played with the edges of reality. There's there's no there's no certainty at all that that Orwell and and, and Jones knew each other. Um, most of those titles in the list I put on the screen, I've, I've only become familiar with by uh, recent research. The one 
which struck me because I can remember the reviews coming out was Dutch, the biography of Ronald Reagan. I don't know if anyone else is nodding and remembering when it first appeared that it features the author taking walks, imagining that he's talking to Reagan, even in what was then supposed to be an authorised biography. It was an extraordinary um, um, change in the style of, of writing. Um, and it was I think it was found to be controversial. Uh, there, of course, there wasn't going to be a great popularity of biographies of, of Ronald Reagan on this side of the Atlantic. So I think I suspect I was probably reading about it in, in, in perhaps the New York Review of Books or somewhere like that. Um, so it's, it's a genre. Um, DJ Taylor has tied it to historical fiction. Um, uh, Helena by by uh, Evelyn Waugh. Um, in the comments, uh, David Ford has mentioned the uh, I, uh, I Claudius and Claudius the God by uh, by Robert Graves. Um, I think I disagree with um, with David that I th I think they are a different genre, uh, but um, I suspect that more people will agree with him than with me that there is a continuity but I'm not sure that there is. Um, and, uh, there are one or two people who are now known for it. I noticed that there's uh, Curtis Sittenfield, who uh, is, a, is, a, is a woman writer writing about women, is, has made it something of a speciality. Um, I, but equally, since it's now come into your field with a biography of Lucille Ball <laughs> and, and presumably uh, her control of Desilu Productions, uh, it it's it's going to overlap into many other fields. I I can only tell you that I don't know much, uh, but what I do know is that it it has come as a surprise in some ways. I I, I think Chris, one of the the things that uh, uh, is causing reaction um, is is what David mentioned earlier that the reviewers of the book in the main had very little knowledge of Orwell. Many people who read the book, because it's had incredible amount of uh, promotion by Penguin Random House, a staggering amount, um, because she's such a fluent writer, may well take it literally. What 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 has upset, for 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 example, Rick and and uh, Ariana, uh, is 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 not that she has created dialogue is that the dialogue she's created has no credibility. And if you compare what she wrote and what, uh, for for example, again, a book mentioned earlier, Dennis Glover's Last Man in Europe, uh, there was nothing in there that made me react and think that didn't sound credible. It was the lack of credibility in what she's invented. No, hi, Chris. If I just might say... Uh... The, 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 there's no question that uh, the p bits she's made up, you know, because she has quotes, she quotes Orwell and Eileen. Uh, it's clear that, you know, they, they're obviously made up. I mean, she's not pretending that she <laughs> could have heard them. Uh, I, I worried a, a bit whether, uh, in, in, you know, of course, it's, the, the book is highly, highly critical of Orwell. <clears throat> And uh, in a sense, may damage his reputation, but I think it's in fact it from maybe from her point. Well, I don't. Know, she claims to be in, in many ways uh, quite quite believe it, an admirer of Orwell. Um, uh, it's not. It's going to increase interest. I, I I think in terms of interest, in Orwell. Uh, you know, one thought maybe people say, "Oh, we don't want to read this person because he's so awful." Um, and I don't think that's going to happen. I think, if anything, it's going to increase. Uh, 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 it, it's not going to harm Orwell's being read. Uh, and in fact, it might increase, uh, increase, uh, increase that. If I could just make a point there, it reminds me very much of the controversy that attached itself to the reputation of Elvis Presley a few years after he died when... Um, 
I can't remember his name. It might have been Albert Goodman. I can't remember. Somebody wrote an incredibly vindictive, spiteful book about Elvis that just sort of lambasted him from every possible angle. And there were protests, and the Elvis Presley Society attempted to get the book banned, you know, and pr protested outside uh, bookshops in the US. But, you know, we're about to sell Elvis's bicentenary of his death will be celebrated in, in three years' time. Still seems to be out there. The records still seem to be selling. I, you know, I think it's... The, I suppose what, what what one has to remember that in, in the current climate and given, you know, all the, the, the patriarchal biographers, including myself, who've been working on him over the... There was always going to be a book like this and there will be others. And um, Orwell is big enough to take it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't. Uh, he he is he is such a monument now. He is such a thing that um, you know it, it it really is like you know a pea shooter against an elephant in some ways. I, I don't think ultimately Orwell's re reputation is really going to be afflicted by what the anaphondas of this world say about him. Richard, you've been very patient. Yes, hello. Um, a wonderful meeting to celebrate. Peter's and David's books, and there's been a right, an appropriate critique of um, wifedom. Peter thinks rather like me, this word flawed. I'm writing a, a review of it in the next George Orwell Studies, and my headline, forgive the pun, is fundamentally flawed. The notion of the fictionalization of real people of course goes back to Shakespeare and further beyond it's just been around hasn't it forever there's nothing particularly new about it Shakespeare's histories of course are all fictions but I'm picking up from uh, Masha's point about John Rodden's article in the next um, Orwell Society Journal, which I'm sure everybody will be interested to read. I've been lucky to be able to read it because I've read it. But it got me thinking, and John Rodden argues strongly that um, it will be hard for Orwell to uh, maintain his, as it were, reputation following this attack and the worldwide coverage that this book has received and largely positive from the mainstream reviewers. I agree with uh, David Taylor that um, Orwell will withstand these attacks. I think if we look at the broader um, Orwell studies environment, there were precedents for this. Um, there was Richard Bradford's Orwell man of our time. Um, it set a dangerous precedent because if you remember that book, he used it as um, a hook on which to hang all his prejudices and ideas about everything from Brexit, anti-Semitism, the Labour Party, uh, the British working class, Trump, etc. That set a bad precedent, I felt. Um, another dangerous precedent, I thought, was set by John Sutherland's Orwell's Nose, which, whilst in many ways I enjoyed it, it uh, filled the gaps in the biography with speculation which was often um, in bad taste, frankly. I think Orwell has withstood those attacks, and I think in looking at the broader spread of Orwell studies today. You've been right to stress the books, but there's also the, um, I'd like to give uh, Darcy Moore a plug. He's been writing over the year we're talking about. He's been publishing in uh, George Orwell studies. And it seems to me where the most important Orwellian research must go. It must be to the archives. And the greatness about Darcy Moore is that he's going to the archives, he's interviewing people and producing new uh, information about Orwell's life. That is to me brilliant. Also, uh, we published Angela Smith's um, wonderful um, uh, talk, reproduced her talk to the Orwell so Society AGM, in which she revealed um, the uh, career of 
uh, Eileen at Sunderland Church High School. Uh, a real gap in the research which this article uh, filled, which um, Anna Funder didn't mention. I don't think David mentioned it. And it's a pity because it's a major piece of new research. And one final point, maybe picking up from David's comment about Julia in the novel. <clears throat> I've actually argued always that Orwell presents a question mark over Julia <clears throat> as a spy. I don't think he ever says definitively. And that's the genius of the novel, because had he said she was a spy, it's, it's too obvious. The whole world of spookdom is full of questions. It really is. And Orwell knew that, and he never makes it definite that um, Ju um, uh, she was a spy, Julia was a spy. In fact, David, you mentioned in, in one of the um, recent uh, publications of the uh, original text of 1984, you found out that Orwell actually cut um, a part which uh, might have suggested that she was, because Orwell wanted to leave that question open. So I would have questioned, I know you raised that in your new biography, David, um, and I would um, question that. My The title of my essay on Julia was The Julia Conundrum. It's not Julia the, the um, honey trap, it's Julia the Conundrum. Yeah, Thank you. I, I would I would endorse wholeheartedly what you've said about Darcy. Darcy spent uh, five weeks in India um, in November, December, uh, digging into the archives there and and talking to people. And, and some stunning work is going to come out of that. I know uh, he's constantly digging into archives all over the place, um, Richard. And I and our wives will be following up a piece of his research uh, on uh, this coming week, uh, going down to Cornwall to uh, follow up his research on some of the early influences on Orwell's interest in flora and fauna. Um, fascinating stuff that he digs up. Sylvia. Yes, hi. Um... So everyone's worried about whether Orwell's reputation will be hurt by the Thunder book. But we also have to think about Eileen and what, how much damage she did to Eileen. And um, that'll be harder to recover because there's not too much to go back to refer to. But I always thought when I looked at the cover of her book, it says um, The Invisible Wife. And I think what she proceeded to do was to make Eileen, the real Eileen, even more invisible. She just sort of wiped her out. Well, that's exactly what I said to her when I first got the book. Uh, and I wrote directly to her with some uh, initial thoughts um, that, yeah. that she's diminished Eileen and not, not uh, enhanced her reputation at all. In the real text, she often praises her. You know, it's an mm. exceptionally well-written book, and she does put in a lot of praise about Eileen that I believe she's copying for my book, too. Yeah. In the end, when she puts in the dialogues, the fake dialogues, that's where she really just tries to, seems to want to destroy Eileen's strength. Mm. I also just want to add that I, perhaps the only one who really believe that they did have an open marriage, I really do believe that Eileen had a relationship with um, Quentin's father. And I've seen hints here or there, I wonder if Peter has too, of other um, relationships she had while they were married that haven't, people have tried to uh, research those and didn't find any proof. 
but otherwise she seems very casual about his affairs. She's not um, devastated in any way. In my opinion. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Ariana. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, my own book, um, which is coming out in May, about my mother, Celia Cowan, and her twin sister, Mamain, Paget Hursler, um, I realize that it's going to probably be coming out at exactly the same time as the paperback of Anna Fundert's book, which may yet lead to turf wars. Um, it'd be interesting to see. Now, I'm not suggesting that my book has anything new really to the oral community. You will all know there's nothing very much new there, but the fact of the matter is that it describes the relationship between Orwell and my mother, and indeed Orwell and, and Ines Holden, from the actual documents and the letters, and it's true. And to the general public, it presents an ex very different portrait of Orwell from Anna Funder's book. So... Uh, my last... <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's something that hasn't come up, uh, and it's not really particularly relevant to what we're talking about. But of course, the other great controversy uh, and debatable thing about Orwell is the list. Oh, yes. And 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 uh, do you talk about the list in That's, the book? I do. I have a whole chapter on the list in my book as well. Um, anyway, all I want to say is that we will <laughs> we'll be out there together. Um, and we present very, very polar opposite pictures of Orwell, and it'll be very interesting to see what discussions that may lead to among the, you know, reviewers, general public, whatever. But I certainly, I think I provide a corrective to Anna Fundus' book. Of course, I wrote my book before Anna, Anna Fundus' book was even thought of. I knew nothing about it at the time, but it certainly, and my book is demonstrably based on evidence whereas hers is demonstrably not based on evidence. Well, we we are all looking forward both to reading it and to hearing you talk about it on oh, May the 5th. That's me, Captain. Les, thank you. Um, if I can make a couple of points before I, I go back to a, sh a screen share to show the forthcoming books of 2024. Um, following up on um, Richard Keeble's point, um, on uh, on the website, we've been publishing some more fascinating uh, research by John Lethbridge on uh, the characters around Orwell. Today, we put a new article on um, about Foster Knowles, who was one of the two masters at St. Cyprian's that Orwell liked. Uh, Orwell referred to him as, as an old bachelor, when actually uh, John Lethbridge uh, has shown that he was actually the father of three children but separated from his wife. Um, so I would recommend everyone to look at uh, John Lethbridge's uh, articles on the on the website for these characters uh, who uh, appeared in the background to Orwell's life but had such a strong influence. Orwell mentioned two masters, Sillers and uh, Knowles. Sillers gets a mention in um, Michael Sheldon's biography, uh, Knowles seems to get a mention in nobody's. So this is this is new material. Very good. Um, following on what Peter said, um, Daphne Patai's book, The Orwell Mystique, is out of print. It's quite difficult to get hold of. Um, I didn't read it at the time. I read it sometime later. Um, having read her introduction to uh, Catherine Badikin's The Swastika Night, uh, which I'd found very negative. I was I was prepared to be uh, disappointed and unhappy with the Orwell mystique, but actually I found that it, she was quite positive, despite her feminist position. Um, she was not horribly negative about things. Um, so um, th there are all these works out there, and they all bear uh, reading if they can be found. Um, the the book that Masha. Uh, deals with a lot. The the totalitarian enemy by Franz Borkenau is is a difficult volume to get hold of, but it bears reading if you can get hold of it. I was going to say I was going to deal with the books of twenty twenty four, but I see that Peter Marx has put his hand up, um, yes. so I will I will yield to him. 
Uh, Peter, okay, I'm looking uh, forward can, to can you, you hear me? in Spain. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you, Peter. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. Um, so for me, um, people have talked about um, wifedom as a fictional uh, biography, but I think the, the whole question of, of genre is more complicated and and perhaps problematic, but it speaks to what the book does and what it doesn't do. Um, so for me, you know, th this is a book that brings together or, or mashes, <laughs> mash carbs, mashes up a, a variety of genres. So we've got fiction, we've got letters, we've got diaries, we've got social and cultural history, both recent and more distant. And I think, you know, one of the things that fairly obviously frames this book is the whole question of the, the, the kind of contemporary world, the, the post Me Too uh, situation. So, you know, that framing of wifedom, I think, is something that people are reacting to in a very positive way, that Funder is, is presenting the situation of women and particularly of wives in, in, a, in a way that a lot of readers are responding positively to. So, you know, there's that question of, of the framing of it. But we also have autobiography, so Anna Funder's own autobiography is central. Uh, there's polemic, where she's kind of making an ar argument. There's lit crit, where she's reading Orwell's own writing and often comparing it to either what she thinks uh, Aini's contribution to that might be. Uh, so that, that's kind of interesting in itself, because I think there's a subtext within wifedom that Eileen is A, smarter than Orwell, and B, actually was a better writer in some way, shape, or form that only comes into fruition with um, Animal Farm, which is his best book, I'm putting this in quotes, and is his best book because, uh, because Eileen is a contributor, that basically it's a collaboration. And she uses a quote, I think she uses from Warburg, uh, to say, you know, where, where was this beforehand? Where was this, this kind of, you know, this, uh, the kind of quality of the prose? And of course, you could argue that Warburg, um, didn't really know Orwell's earlier work. So if you if you go back to a, a, if the essays uh, shooting a, an elephant at a hanging a, a, de a decade before, I mean, they have a kind of quality, a clarity um, that is is also evident in in uh, in um, Animal Farm. Anyway, the fact is that that Fonda really sees uh, uh, Eileen as, as as smarter. And I think one of the problems that she has with this is that she doesn't necessarily know the social situation in the 1930s or earlier in uh, in Britain. And one of the really egregious things for me in the book is where she talks about, and this is where Sylvia, Sylvia Toff's book is so different. Sylvia goes into, and because Sylvia is a biography, and I don't know whether Anna Fonda actually says hers, hers is a biography of, of of Eileen as such, it's but anyway, not, uh, it's, so, it's marketed so, as such, though, Peter. Uh, uh, that's different. That's yeah. different, and it's treated as such by reviewers. But that's different from what the book mm. itself is. And I think where where uh, Sylvia does really amazing work is looking at Eileen's record at Oxford mm. with the reports. Now, implicit in in Anna Funder's reading of Eileen is that she basically was done down at Oxford. By sexist, um, by sexist uh, um, examiners, and so she she writes in in her book. If I were writing a fiction, I would have, uh, and I'm I'm sort of quoting this from memory. If I were writing a piece of fiction about Eileen's time at Oxford, I'd have a hand on the knee, or uh, someone asking for a, a, a credit for a kiss. Now this is completely fabricated, and what Sylvia's uh, biography shows is that, uh, you know, and that's why she didn't get the first, and she needed the first to become a lecturer, she gets a 2-1. Now, the thing about that is that 2-1's a very good mark for a start, but also if you look at uh, Sylvia's book, where she has the reports of Eileen's uh, reviewers, her, her examiners, they're all kind of, you know, B+, plus, 1A-, minus, some Cs. She's never anything other than a 2-1 student. But, of course, for, for Anna's book to work, Eileen has to be sort of done down here, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a kind of interesting way that she selects uh, the bits that work for her. And just so I don't ramble on too long, there's, there's one where she um, squeezes together two quotes from uh, DJ Taylor's biography, uh, where she said, the, the 2003, where she says, 
Orwell's uh, at a um, at a dad's army uh, in a home guard uh, meeting, and he has a they're playing cards, and uh, Orwell loses, and he walks off with this young young man who's who's part of it, and then later uh, there's another scene where Orwell's talking with this guy, and the guy asks him. Um, are you a communist? And Orwell says, you know, what do you mean? It depends on what you mean by communist. And, and DJ Taylor writes, you know, this is all playing the dark horse. Now, Anna Fonda reads that, if you if you go to that section of wifedom, as though DJ Taylor is signaling to us, as, as biographers do when they talk about this, that there's some sort of sexual goings on here. So it, it presents it as a kind of grooming exercise that Orwell, that the dark horse is DJ, no, DJ Taylor's sense that Orwell's this kind of dark sexual horse, and then it's connected with the earlier moment. But of course, these things are completely different. And the dark, the dark horse isn't meant to, as far as I know, maybe David could say something, but the dark horse doesn't mean something about sexuality. Um, so we have, and, and just to finish, the book starts off with Eileen writing uh, a letter, and there's a kind of fictionalized beginning, and then she starts writing. Um, but the thing that that Funda takes out of the, the letter, she includes parts of the letter, is a section where Eileen talks about how her mother, who Eileen's mother, during the week of their marriage, had ridden her really hard all that week. And there's that, and Orwell himself, and, uh, and, and the auntie turning up. Now, these things, are, the mother is taken out completely. It doesn't appear. So the, the and at the same time we're hearing because this is the fictionalized part of the book, we're hearing Orwell banging nails into a into a wall somewhere. So not only is the mother excised from this from from why Eileen's feeling so wrought, the aunt's the aunt's kind of contribution is is sort of separated by a paragraph of of fiction, and then we've got the fictionalized Orwell making a, a fucking nuisance of himself off behind and so just in that opening in that opening se uh, section the opening pages of the book Orwell is set up in a particular way other things are excised out and it's a very clever and I think sort of duplicitous way of opening the argument um so I'll stop there do you want to add something David before we go back to Les and then I think we should uh thank everybody and conclude this evening and can, sorry, am I unmuted now? You are, yes, David. Yeah, um, thank you, Peter, yes, for that. I enjoyed your, I enjoyed reading what you wrote about uh, the Funder Allen, in fact, about my book. Um, in fact, yeah, in the original 2003 biography, that paragraph, and it was Denzel Jacobs, Orwell's right. younger Jewish friend, and it's simply there to discuss Orwell's the very complicated position, political position of the early 1940s, has nothing to do with any sexual come on at all. Um, but it's it's rather redolent. I, one final point I would make is what, what you were saying about um, her in, her difficulty with some of the kind of behavioural tropes of the 1930s. That, and then another one of the, I, I seem to remember Funda agonises over what um, Eileen in one of her letters means when she describes an emotional situation as Delian, D-E-L-L-I-A-N. Now, all, uh, Eileen is referring to the popular romantic novelist Ethel M. Dell, great, great writer in her time. Uh, and that's the gloss. And, and that, that that's why it's so so crucial to have at least some kind of vestigial understanding of the kind of popular culture of the 1930s before you before you embark on these the, these exercises. Oh, thank thank you, Les. Would you like to conclude with your look ahead of books, and uh, then I would like everybody to unmute and thank our speakers because it's been a fascinating evening, and thank you to everybody who's contributed to the discussion. Right. Books we know are forthcoming in 2024. Um, already published, Brian May's 1948, a prequel. You'll find a review by uh, Nicola Rossi uh, on uh, the All World Society website. Um, uh, an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary book in many ways. And um, a third alternative to Norman Bissell and to The Last Man in Europe. Paul Theroux, Burma Saib which has appeared in the last week, um, which uh, we've heard, um, I think, has um, mixed feelings. Uh, Duncan Roberts' Orwell à Paris um, is due to come out later in the spring. Um, 
Duncan Roberts and Darcy Moore uh, at one point were working together to research Orwell's life in Paris. Um, it's perfectly clear now that um, Orwell's down and out in Paris and London um, only reflects small parts of the time he spent in those cities um, and that there's a lot more to uh, discover about what he was doing. For instance, there must have been periods when he wasn't down and out in the city and was doing other things. People are already looking forward to DJ Taylor's Who is Big Brother, a reader's guide to George Orwell. Um, and forthcoming two by uh, Nathan Waddell, the, uh, the lecturer at the University of Birmingham and um, visitor to one of the Northeastern universities now, the Oxford Handbook of George Orwell and George Orwell in Context. I think they're coming out from separate publishers. Um, but we can see that while 2023 was a very detailed year and one rousing uh, much discussion, I'm sure that there will be just as much interest coming in 2024. And what with events going on on which Orwell has so much relevance as Masha's book uh, makes clear, I'm sure that Orwell will remain in the news. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, thank you. And uh, if you could all unmute, uh, say thank you to our speakers, please. And uh, look forward to seeing you all next month when, uh, as I said, Glenn Burgess will be talking on on his book. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Awesome. And good evening. Thank you. thank you, Peter. Peter, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you.